Well now, today was going to be our APCM, which is our annual meeting service, where we review the past year and celebrate what God has been doing among us, and where we choose from amongst our number and commission new leaders, where we thank individuals for outstanding service, and we look forward to the year ahead of us. It's a service where we share our vision for where we believe the Lord is calling us to go and we get on board with uh, what his plans are. Well, obviously, we cannot have a meeting like that today when we're all sitting at home. It needs to have people who are gathered into one place for that. Uh, because of the COVID-19 situation, the Church of England has extended the date limit for annual meetings by five months to the end of October. And we have not yet set a revised date for ours at All Saints, but I do not expect that it will be possible to do it before my last Sunday here, which is to be the 7th of June. And so I wanted on this occasion to be able to record my thanks on all of your behalf to a number of really important individuals, VIPs in All Saints. Karen Killick has served as church warden with absolute distinction for, I think it's about eight years now, and she is going to step down uh, this year. Karen has been such a rock, and most of you have no idea just how soon this church would grind to a halt without our church wardens, but I do. And I want to honour here both Martin, Howard and Karen for their practical dedication uh, for their spiritual wisdom and for their moral support. Thank you. Karen is going to continue to have an important role, though, uh, because she is Deputy Chair of the PCC and hopes to stay in that role, which is really important during a vacancy and during the process of finding my successor. As Karen steps down from being warden at the APCM, Anne Rolf has agreed to stand as her replacement, and I want to commend her to you all very warmly. Two other key PCC members will be also standing down this summer. First of all, John Littlehales is handing on the secretary role. Uh, John has prepared agendas and circulated documents and typed up minutes and convened us all to meet with unfailing competence and courtesy, also I think for about eight or nine years. Uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Jonathan Backhouse has offered to do that job from June onwards. Another change this summer, of course, is Cathy, who's stepping down as our treasurer, because much as I'm sure you'd love to keep her, she has to come with me. Uh, Kathy eagerly agreed to become our treasurer four years ago, although she had zero experience, really because nobody felt able or willing to take on that role at that time, and her heart was moved to say, well, I'll have a go. Kathy's uh, always up for Mission Impossible, which explains in part, I suppose, why she agreed to be my wife. Uh, and it's been a real learning curve, both being married to me and managing the church finances. And I think Cathy would be the first to say she's not a natural numbers person. Uh, she's never used a spreadsheet before she did this role, uh, but she has handled our finances, I'm sure you'll agree with me, with care and uh, discretion and efficiency, making full use of our excellent finance team. Uh, Richard Spratt, who is our assistant treasurer, will be uh, taking over from Cathy in the short term, and he will gradually hand over to our next treasurer, who we expect to be Kevin Storer. Now, all these proposed changes are, of course, dependent upon you voting for them when the APCM finally takes place. But I wanted you to know now that plans are in place and that we have people willing and able to serve in these really key roles. And finally, I wanted to thank on your behalf, David Emerton, who, with Linda, took on the role of Life Group Coordinator about five years ago. David's been doing this job on his own since Linda began to, began to suffer with ill health. And under the Emmertons' leadership, the number of life groups at All Saints has grown appreciably, and the number of people who are members of life groups is the highest it has been in all my time here. 
And I think the lockdown that we're all going through at the moment has shown how valuable these groups are as living networks of caring and spiritually connected people. Ruth and Stuart Johnson have already taken on this role and I'm sure you join me in wishing them all well in their new ministry. Hi there, um, it's been two weeks since we were last live and unplugged uh, here at Long Newton and um, how's everybody doing? Uh, has cabin fever hit? Um, are we getting more frustrated? Feeling a bit restricted? Are we getting more irritated by whoever's living in the house with us? Have we got a sense of being captive in our own home? Are we missing what we can't do? Uh, maybe what we don't have? After three weeks of self-isolation? Well, I don't know about you, but um, I think it's time to stop these negative thoughts. But how do we do that? We're stuck in this situation, aren't we? We're, we're kind of trapped. We need a change of perspective. We need what I'd call a spiritual kick up the rear. Planning and preparing the worship for today, um, I experienced a spiritual kick up the rear, which was a good thing. Um, my eyes and my mind and my heart were um, experienced a switch of perspective. And instead of focusing on restrictions that have been imposed, I started thinking about what my heavenly dad, what our heavenly dad has, has provided for me. He's provided me with a home. He's provided me with a family. He's provided me with a beautiful planet. Spring, to me, screams of new life. It screams of fresh starts. It screams of hope. So regardless of self-isolation, I'm reminded that Yahweh always is and he always will be. He'll be our hope. He is our hope. He's our strength and will always be. He's our provider and he will always be. He's our rescuer and he'll always be that. So this morning, join me, Duncan and I, as we change our for focus together and we sing songs of hope and songs of strength and songs of love that Jesus died to give us all, all of us. I'm going to read some excerpts from Psalm 42 just before we start to sing. And it says this. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you. Then God promises to love me all day, sing songs all through the night. My life is God's prayer. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. Let's worship together. As we sing this first song together, maybe you can visualise if you've been out for a walk recently on this glorious um, springtime.
him to die, I scarce can take it in. That's on the cross, my burden gladly bearing. He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be.
Thank you that you are great. That you are above everything. Jesus, that you're in everything. And in this difficult, strange time, Jesus, you're in it all. You have rule and reign. Help us to trust you, Jesus. Help us to put our, our hope in you and switch our focus and our perspective, Jesus, to you you provide everything that we need you. Jesus you are everything that we need how great you are some of the lines I love in this next song it talks about him fighting our battles and we're in a massive battle at the minute but he's fighting it
Thank you that as we step into the realms of worship, wherever we are today, that you are there and you melt our hearts and you change our whole mindset. We experience your presence, we experience your peace, your strength. We can be overwhelmed with your love, Jesus.
is it who he is? Let's have that moment of an attitude of gratitude. Jesus, we thank you for keeping us safe. We thank you for providing us with everything that we need, Jesus. We thank you for changing our, pers our perspectives, Jesus, on what's important. A love and a passion for you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for stirring up love for other people. You are worthy to be praised. Oh, Jesus, worthy to be praised. So lift up his name with the sound of singing. Oh, Lift up his name in all the earth and lift up your voice and give him glory for he is worthy to be praised. Well, good morning, everybody. The evangelist J. John once spoke about getting on a plane and the man sitting next to him on this airplane got chatting with him. And it turned out that he was a very successful businessman in quite a large multinational company. And when the conversation turned to what J. John did for a living, he said, oh, well, I work for a multinational concern, actually. He said, we have branches in every country in the world. He said, we care for our clients from birth to death. We specialize in heart transplants. Our company manual, he said, is the world's best selling book. We run hospitals, we run schools, we run banks, well, food banks. We run crisis pregnancy centers, publishing houses uh, and nursing homes. And when you join our organization, you get free fire insurance thrown in as well. And the guy says, wow, really, this sounds amazing. Tell me more. So J. John said, I'm just about to. I haven't finished yet. He said, our goods and services are free to anybody who asks. He says, our founder knows everything and lives everywhere. Our CEO is totally amazing. He started out as a joiner. He lived rough for a while. He was disowned by his family and hated by rivals with vested interests. Finally, he said they stitched him up and he ended up on death row. Can you believe it? On trumped up charges and they bumped him off, but he rose from the dead. And now I speak with him every day. And that, my friends, is the church. This is who we are. This is the organization we belong to. You belong to the world's biggest movement, the biggest movement in human history. And globally, we are still rapidly growing. Well, my talk today is about the direction that God is taking this little corner of the worldwide church, All Saints Preston on Seas, over the next year. And in a sense, of course, who can say? Who can say where God is going to take us? We've seen, haven't we, with this current pandemic, that it's impossible to precisely predict anything in the future. We've seen over the past few weeks that we have nothing at all, actually, under our control. The Formula One driver from the 1970s, he was world champion, actually, Mario Andretti once said, if everything seems under control, it's just that you're not going fast enough. And nothing feels under control at the moment for us. Who can say where everything will be in two, three, four months time? Nobody knows exactly. But we know that our future is in God's hands. And one of the good things to come Good things to come out of this health catastrophe is the realization that we are utterly dependent upon the Lord for any sense of what is up and what is down. And so I should say, if the Lord wills, with the book of James, chapter four, if the Lord wills, 
this talk is how is about how we envisage the direction of travel at All Saints as far as we can see at the present time. Well, every church has a different character or personality, if you like, which comes with strengths and weaknesses. All Saints, I believe, has a very clear identity. I think we we know really what we are, don't we? But I want to help us to think about the, the kind of church God wants us to be. What is God's calling upon us as a church? What is our mission and what is our purpose going into the next decade as we begin the, the 2020s? Even in New Testament times, churches quickly developed a kind of reputation, if you like, for being one thing or the other. Uh, reading through the Acts of the Apostles, it seems to me that the Jerusalem church was big, but quite conservative, very ill at ease with new ideas. Corinth was charismatic, but quarrelsome and immature. Philippi was generous and supportive. Rome, as we saw last summer, was influential, but divided amongst Jews and Gentiles. Athens was intellectual, but small. Thessalonica was fast growing but maybe just a little bit hung up about the end times. And if you were to ask me which New Testament church All Saints most resembles and should aspire to resemble more, I would say it's the church in Antioch. And I'm going to read to you this morning two passages from the Acts of the Apostles, both of which are about this church, Antioch. Uh, see if you can identify some of the characteristics of this church, Antioch, and of all saints from what I'm about to read. So first is in Acts 11, and we're going to begin at verse 19. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that uh, all the grace of God, all that the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. And this happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. And then Acts 13, beginning at verse 1. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work for which I've called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Well, that is Antioch. Uh, was it a perfect church? No. 
we know that two of its main leaders, in fact, Paul and Barnabas, had a public stand up row at the end of Acts 15. That is not good. So it was not a perfect church. But there are many signs of health, I think, in this local church that I think are reproduced in all saints and want to reproduce more. And I'm just going to run through five of them quite briefly, if I can. So first of all, it was a faith sharing church. It was a faith sharing church. This was actually the first ever Christian community where people came to faith in Jesus without knowing anything about the Old Testament beforehand. But that was no obstacle for them at all. They just got on with sharing their faith through personal testimony. And it says in Acts 11 that the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Secondly, it was a biblically trained church. Uh, there were so many non-Jews coming to faith in Christ with no knowledge at all of the scriptures. And they needed a lot of teaching. And so Barnabas and Saul uh, got together. Saul came in to do some Bible teaching. And the word tells us that for a whole year, it says, Saul and Barnabas taught great numbers of people. Now, children grow by um, eating. And this is food. This is spiritual food. The number one reason why people don't grow in their Christian faith is because they don't open their Bible. Uh, Jesus said that people cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And you show me someone with a Bible that's falling apart, and I'll show you a person who isn't falling apart. Well, the third thing is that it was a financially generous church. Our reading tells us that the Christians in Antioch each decided according to their ability to give financially to enable blessing to flow to other Christians elsewhere. And they did this, we're told, during a famine that was empire wide and that includes Antioch, therefore. So they gave away some of what they had knowing that they themselves would be affected by the same scarcity, amazing generosity. A giving Christian is a joyful Christian and a giving church is a joyful and healthy church. This document here says as much about the spiritual health of all saints as any other document we have. This is the church accounts. The Washington DC church leader, Mark Batterson says, God will bless the local church in proportion to its giving to missions and its caring for the poor. And I agree with that. Fourthly, the church at Antioch was a prophetically inspired church. Acts 11 says some prophets came down to Antioch and one of them, a guy named Agabus, Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine is going to spread over the entire Roman world. This happened, we're told, during the reign of Claudius. And it did. We have historical records to show that prophecy was, was spot on. Now, some Christians are very wary of prophecy, but 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us not to treat prophecies with contempt. It says, test everything. Hold on to what is good. Um, healthy churches eagerly desire spiritual gifts, including prophecy, and they encourage prophetic words. And when they're given, they weigh them carefully. And I hope all saints will continue to do that and to press into that and ask God for more of it. And fifthly, it was a culturally diverse church. The leaders all mentioned in chapter 13 were from different backgrounds. Barnabas was a Cypriot, Simeon was a black African, Lucius was a Jew but from North Africa, very different culture, Manaean was from high places, Herod's household, and Saul was a Roman citizen from Tarsus which is modern day Turkey. So it was a, it was a multi-ethnic and international church. And this is not about tokenism, it's about appreciating the variety of different perspectives in a church under the Lord's headship, 
the best churches, I think, have people in leadership who are male and female, married and single, academic and practical, extrovert and introvert, younger and older, well off and with more modest means, locally brought up and hailing from elsewhere. It's good to have diversity in our church and that should be reflected in the leadership too. But I want to draw, what I want to draw your attention to in the last five minutes or so of my talk today is the sending focus of this church in Antioch. Acts chapter 13 explains that they prayed and fasted and then they sent out two valued key leaders. That's 40 percent of their leadership team. They sent them out in one go and they gave away the very best that they had. But why would they do that? Why would they deliberately weaken themselves to that extent? And the answer is that they wanted to bless others with the gospel. Give it away. They had a bigger vision than just watering their own garden. Healthy churches reproduce their life and they spread their DNA elsewhere. And when you think of this church releasing a little team of uh, four or five to Long Newton about 20 years ago now, and then sending Alan and Nikki Fairish with a handful of others to Stockton 12 years ago, and then sending out Sylvia Wilson to Egglescliff about six years ago, and Stuart and Nicola Main to Sunderland, I think it was three years ago, you can see that this is our history. This is what we are about as well. And although we love all those people I just mentioned, and we miss them when they've left us for good, we can also see how grace has been sent out from here to there to grow and produce life in other places. And the remarkable thing is this. In every case where we've sent people out, the church here at All Saints was not depleted by the sending. Because every time we sent people out, we grew. As we gave the blessing that God's given us away, it did not deplete us because God is nobody's debtor and he just pours more and more and more in. On the 12th of October last year, Elihud Kipchoge ran a marathon. It was the first marathon to be run in sub two hours. It was the first time in history this had been achieved. Uh, it wasn't an official record because he had uh, assistance, didn't he, from pace setting runners and so on. Never mind. My point is this. What was seen before as impossible, unachievable, beyond reach, actually became reality for one fundamental reason. Kipchoge had a team around him. And if we're going to do the impossible under God, we really need each other. Uh, to work as a team when we send our friends out a year from now. Because this time next year, in fact, All Saints will send out its biggest team yet. We plan to send out 30 individuals to Newtown under Paul and Liz Arnold's leadership. This is not going to be a piece of cake. Church planting never is. There is a lot to do. St Paul's has not seen much growth for decades now. There needs to be a reconnection evangelistically with the community nearby. And that's going to be a real adventure. Um, at New Wine last summer, a man called John Soper from Exeter Community Church, or Network Church it's called, was uh, talking about looking for a venue for his new church plant, which um, started a few years ago. And he came across a really nice cafe that wasn't open on Sundays and he arranged to meet the manager, who it's fair to say is not an authority on comparative religion, this guy. So the cafe owner says, um, so tell me about this new thing you want to do, man. So John describes his vision for this church plant. Student focus, lots of community, uh, life related Bible teaching, contemporary worship, outreach to the poor, signs and wonders. So the guy frowns as he tries to get his head around all this. And he says, uh, is your religion one of those religions that slaughters chickens live? And John thinks for a moment and he, he says, well, well, no, uh, no, but we do drink the blood of our leader. 
And the guy says, oh, wow, that is so cool, man. You can come. Now, I tell you that story because reconnecting missionally with Newtown is undoubtedly going to throw up some very off the wall conversations like that. Many people outside the church have no idea at all what we're about. But I know this, God is going to do a new thing. The word of the Lord never returns to him without having achieved the purpose for which he sent it. The church in Newtown, St. Paul's, is in need of some revitalization and it is going to get it. There needs to be a renewal from the Holy Spirit in worship and, and a new expectancy in prayer and ministry. And that is going to happen. It's going to be so exciting to see. Everybody on the team we're going to send out there will have a vital part to play. There are no passengers on the team. Everybody gets to play. And the good news is that we have 24 already signed up to go. And in addition to this, there's going to be funding, significant funding from Central Church for new staff to really give them a good start. These are really exciting times to be living in. This next year, between now and April 2021, we're going to see a ramping up of prayer and fasting until it's at fever pitch by the time the team is sent out. Remember, Barnabas and Saul were sent out after a time of prayer and fasting. And when our team goes, we're going to suddenly be looking at a few more empty seats around us. Don't worry about that. Don't worry. Our job is to pray, to reach out all over again and to ask God to fill those seats with new people. We're going to have to get used to sharing our faith again and praying uh, like never before for the growth of the Lord's work in Preston on Tees as well. And this is healthy. This is what church is about. Jesus said, I will build my church. Do you know, he waited a long time to say those words. He held it and held it and held it until the day Peter said, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ, aren't you? And then Jesus could say it. Yes, I will build my church. That was the first time Jesus had ever used the word church. He waited until that precise moment because you can only build church with people who get who Jesus is and have the boldness to say it to a waiting world. Let us pray. Lord, this is going to be such an exciting year. And this time next year, who knows where we're going to be, but we have an idea. We have an outline sketch. And Father, we pray over this next year that you will build up the team. We pray, Lord, you'll add to its numbers. Father, we pray uh, that you would really sharpen those who are staying as well in terms of being able and ready to share our testimony and reach out to our community once more, that the empty chairs will soon be filled up again with new believers, new people coming into the fellowship of the church, added through faith. Father, we pray for this, and we pray for a really successful and dynamic church plant into Newtown. We pray, Father, that they'd soon make real progress and see the church grow. People come to Christ, to faith, and be filled with the Spirit and overflowing with joy. Lord, build your church. You said you would do it. We hold you at your word, Lord God. Build your church that the gates of hell may not prevail against us. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi there. Um, it's been two weeks since we were last live and unplugged uh, here at Long Newton. Um, how's everybody doing? Uh, has cabin fever hit? Um, are we getting more frustrated? feeling a bit restricted? Are we getting more irritated by whoever's living in the house with us? Have we got a sense of being captive in our own home? Are we missing what we can't do? Uh, maybe what we don't have after three weeks of self-isolation? Well, I don't know about you, but um, I think it's time to stop these negative thoughts. But how do we do that? 
we're stuck in this situation out we were, we're kind of trapped we need a change of perspective we need what I'd call a spiritual kick up the rear planning and preparing the worship for today um, I experienced a spiritual kick up the rear which was a good thing um, my eyes and my mind and my heart were um, experienced a switch of perspective and instead of focusing on restrictions that have been imposed I started thinking about what my heavenly dad what our heavenly dad has, has provided for me he's provided me with a home he's provided me with a family he's provided me with a beautiful planet spring to me screams of new life it screams of fresh starts it screams of hope so regardless of self-isolation, I'm reminded that Yahweh always is and he always will be. He'll be our hope. He is our hope. He's our strength and will always be. He's our provider and he will always be. He's our rescuer and he'll always be that. So this morning, join me, Duncan and I, as we change our focus together, and we sing songs of hope and songs of strength and songs of love that Jesus died to give us all, all of us. I'm going to read some excerpts from Psalm 42 just before we start to sing. And it says this. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you. Then God promises to love me all day. Sing songs all through the night. My life is God's prayer. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. Let's worship together. this first song together maybe you can visualize if you've been out for a walk recently on this glorious um, springtime
sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That's on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be, oh, how great thou
Jesus, we thank you that you are great. That you are above everything. Jesus, that you're in everything. And in this difficult, strange time, Jesus, you're in it all. You have rule and reign. Help us to trust you, Jesus. Help us to put our, our hope in you and switch our focus and our perspective, Jesus, to you. Because you provide everything that we need. Jesus, you are everything that we need. How great you are. the lines I love in this next song it talks about him fighting our battles and we're in a massive battle at the minute but he's fighting it Heaven 
your house today. Let him into your heart today. Let him give you that change of perspective, that different focus. And the work seems to open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop you, God? in power who can stop you God Jesus I thank you that as we step into the realms of worship wherever we are today that you are there and you melt our hearts and you change our whole mindset we experience your presence we experience your peace your strength we can be overwhelmed with your love, Jesus. is worthy to be praised. 